All right, guys, so I'm still a little bit under the weather, but let me try to finish this lecture for you guys so we don't fall behind too much. So um, we're going to talk about dinosaurs. We started that like um, theme last class, and we said like how they went extinct. And then we mentioned that not all of them are big. We mentioned that some of them are actually fairly small, like these Comptosognathos that I have right here. But some of them, like these Apatosaurs, are in a group of dinosaurs that are the gigantic dinosaurs that can be like up to 96 feet long. And that's actually very impressive, right? Dinosaurs are not like, are often portrayed like in movies as being um, single colored, but they're not. They can be multicolored. Um, um, there are reasons to believe that, like with evidence in the fossil record of some pigmentation showing up in many of them. So they can be as bright colored as birds, right? And they have like some evolutionary trends that go on for them. One of them is this strong, lightweight uh, post-cranial pneumatization, right? This post-cranial pneumatization, pneumatization here, right, just means air pockets inside the bone, right? The bones of dinosaurs have a lot of air pockets, very similar to bones of chickens, right? So we actually have a bone structure like that is hollow as well, right? If I'm drawing a bone, I'm going to have like this sort of aspect for the bones, right? And in the middle of that bone, there is a hollow aspect to it. Like we have a core of our bones is completely hollow like that right forming like let me do like a tube here inside like tube inside a tube like that right this is our bones the difference is that like the dinosaurs what they're going to actually have like this um uh hollow part is going to be much much bigger so these are actually a much hot larger like medullary cavity and sometimes with more pockets on the outside like making these bones extremely lightweight, right? So this is one of the things that dinosaurs will have. They're, these are composed actually a couple of things. Being lightweight allows you like to mm, uh, have bones of lightweight, like allows you to have, uh, to travel longer distances. Um, it takes a lot of energy to move bones around. Bones are heavy, they correspond to 30% of your mass, right? And then being lightweight will allow them to travel long distances, but also, like um you'd allow them to have more mass you know because what actually happens is that um as i become like my bones become more hollowed my skull which tends to be really heavy like uh, because of the bones that i have it becomes easier to carry you know like to be this large you're gonna have to have a head that is actually extremely lightweight Otherwise, you're not going to have the muscle power to actually support that head, right? So uh, these air pockets allow long distance traveling and also um, you can actually say like that allow them to, to have some sort of gigantism going on for them, right? Other things that go on for them for them and this next like thing that I actually um, is listed here in the slide for you is associated with this long distance traveling as well right is that there's a trend on dinosaurs towards bipedalism bipedalism is, is by far the most efficient way to move long distances right and because they are becoming bipedal uh, they can only do so or they can only do so no but they can do that more effectively if their hip structure is modified so dinosaurs have a hip structure that is different than the hip structure of other lizard-like animals like them, like them, right? So what actually happens for them is that they're going to have like a perforated acetabulum and an internal femoral head, right? So for reference, I'm going to draw a human here. I'm going to be really quick on my drawing because I don't have much time. Like, and my human here has, um, oh, there's a horrible human. Let me try it again. Uh, I'll draw a pelvic bone. A pelvic bone is not that difficult to draw. So this is our pelvic bone, right? And on the back of your pelvic bone, you have the sacrum there. If you don't know what, what I'm doing, this is the vertebral column showing up here. I'm not going to do the whole thing. And then in this pelvic bone, what I actually have, I have a socket right here, right? Your pelvic bone has a socket right there, 
right? Let me finish the grab coupon completely. This is more or less, there's a pubic symphysis right here now. And that's that socket there. That socket is the point of attachment for your femur. The femur is the bone that connects to, that is the bone of your thigh. So your femur comes right here, right? And then your kneecap here and then your lower leg, right? So this socket right here in red, this socket in red here is your acetabulum, right? And the femoral head, like the femoral head is this structure right here. You are bipedal like that many dinosaurs were, right? So they have to have this like innovation for the hip femur attachment that allows them to have uh, uh, rely more on bones to support themselves against gravity instead of relying on muscle to support themselves against gravity. Not that they're not going to use muscle, but the bones do a good chunk. The arrangement of the bones do a, a good chunk of the work there. Okay, so moving on, right? Now I can actually see like many different types of pelvic girdles here of dinosaurs like, that are combined like uh, upright list in, uh, uh, in st stance with the long strides, right? Initially, when I look at like ancient archosaurs here, I don't have much of a socket being formed there, right? The femur of basal archosaurs projects horizontally from the pelvis. That means like this here, what it means is that the animal is here and the legs project that way. Right? So it's that sprawl arrangement that I mentioned before, right? What I'm gonna try to do is actually to move those legs from that, like from the elbow pointing outward right here, right? To actually a body arrangement in which the animal like is here and the legs, like I mentioned, are in that parasagittal arrangement with the elbows and knees like right in the middle there, right? This is the ground for reference. Okay, so, um, Dinosaurs initially start with this arrangement that I'm mentioning here, right? But then we're going to move like to something that is slightly different, right? We're going to move like to two different types of hips, right? And basically can divide the dinosaurs in two major groups, right? One that is called Sauritia and one that is called Ornistitia. I'll come back to them later, right? But these guys, what they actually move, uh, what, what the difference in them is that for the Sauritias, they have their pubis right here, projecting anteriorly, right? The head of the dinosaur, like, should be here, right? And this here is the pelvis of the dinosaur, right? So, and then their femur projects like towards the head, right, anteriorly. So those are the sauritia. On the other hand of that, I have a group of dinosaurs that are called ornistitians. The ornistitians are these guys here and their pubis, as you can see here, projects posteriorly. The dinosaur again, well, forgive me my border on dinosaur, but the, the pubis projects away from the head, right? So what does that mean, right? What, what do those two arrangements mean? Um, it two different ways to come up with the same solution. The idea here is to be able to have a socket that gets deeper and deeper um, as you, the dinosaurs become more advanced uh, phylogenetic wise, and then these like muscles, um, the femoral protector muscles, originate from the pubis, right, right here, right, the femoral protector muscles here allow like in the femoral retractor ones allow the leg to swing that way in that way right so it's a, it's a long stride so like it allows the leg to go like uh, this way as opposed like to what the way um uh lizards would move around which is like the actually leg that has to go like over the head as they're uh they're walking that's probably position right so this is more energy efficient when it comes to movement right um one thing that i think is important to notice here is this like that even though I said that I have this sauritius here and the ornistitius, some ornistitius don't have the pubis projecting posteriorly exclusively. So look at these guys. The femur, the pubis here points to the back. Here it still points to the back, but right, some of that um, 
those interstitials actually develop like a forward extension of the pubis right here that allows the pubis to be projected anteriorly. This is a source of confusion for the classification of dinosaurs. Not only this is uh, um, an interesting arrangement, but it's a source of confusion for the classification of dinosaurs. And I'm going to talk about that like in one second. Okay, so let's move on. Right. So, to for in order for dinosaurs to become big, lightweight, and actually become uh, not lightweight, in order for dinosaurs to, to become big and travel longer distances, I not only I had a modification of the pelvis, but I also have a modification of the tarsals, the bones that actually make the the uh, the ankle of the dinosaur. Right. <clears throat> if there is indeed a trend towards bipedalism, then the ankles become a way more important joint when it comes to propulsion, right? So if this is going to be like the major source of propulsion for these animals on land, then I better have a really stable joint. And I can compare these two joints when I actually see the arrangement of joints for other lizards. Specifically, I'm contrasting this with Kurotarsal, which is the, the joint arrangement of many crocs, right? And like the Mesotarsal arrangement, that dinosaurs would have, right, on this side right here. And you don't have to be an engineer to figure out that which one of these two is more stable. So I'm going to highlight these two bones here, the calcanus and the astralagus, and how they sit at an angle to each other, allowing the, the forces to be distributed that way here. You use like a different, it's highlighted there, but I like the drawing. So the forces are distributed at an angle here. Right, so all the weight that comes here transfers to the calcaneus right here, and then transfer to these bones right here. Right, so this is not super stable. I mean, it can be like um, you just have to rely on a lot of muscle power to prevent the wobbling of that sideways. Right, so to prevent that from happening, dinosaurs what they actually had they modified that structure. They have <coughs> Excuse me. Their astralagos and, and calcaneus parallel uh, to each other, and now I have a straight edge between my uh, metatarsals, which are the bones that make the sole of my feet here, right? And this allows me to support uh, more weight and not use as much energy, right? So, like this ankle and the hip structure like separate the dinosaurs now into two different lineages the ornistitia and the sarisha let's talk a little bit more about them so in order to talk about them like um let me turn off the camera preview here so i can just use the the phylogeny here right so first and most obvious thing obvious thing which is to highlight the two major groups right so on this side right here i have my sarisha and on this side right here I have my ornithischia, right? They were not present for a long period of time. All then dead here by the end of Cretaceous right here, right? Uh, but let's see like major difference between those two groups, right? Um, first, right? <coughs> you see the, like the names of these groups. One is like called ornithischia. Ornitho means bird in Ischia. Uh, ornithischia here, missing an S there. Um, so, ornitho means birds, right? So these guys have the arrangement of bird, uh, of hips that are called uh, the hips of birds. But if you look at the ornithischia here, you do not see any bird there. Birds are actually on the other side here. And then this is confusing then. Because you have some dinosaurs that whose hips resemble the hip of a bird, and then the sarisha whose hips actually uh, resemble like a lizard, and yet the ones that resemble a lizard are the ones that contain birds, and that makes no sense, right? But turns out that remember that I said that some of the sarisha have the pubis modified to project anteriorly, so the sarisha, the sarisha guys. Their hips, like, um, do a, a, a evolutionary convergence, like they converge, and I'm using like convergence, converge here in the sense of 
uh, evolutionary convergence to like bird-like arrangement, right? And this bird-like arrangement of these guys here uh, tells me that the more derived forms, the ones that are like further away from the source, are moving to this arrangement that resembles the bird, the hips of modern birds, right? Um, and some people actually have disputed this phylogeny to some extent, and I'm going to talk about the disputes in one second, too. right? Uh, <laughs> the two major disputes that I have right now are that the the group of theropods, right, theropods that are long time like considered to be like a sister group to the sauropods, like these guys here. For the longest time, these guys have been considered to be Sauricia, lizard hip. And some like recent phylogeny says like this is not a derived like convert convergence of um, bird hips uh, of lizard hip dinosaurs to becoming bird hip. This has been a mis misclassification. So the traditional phylogeny that has been proposed is trying to the, 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 there was um, there was um, the traditional phylogeny that was considered to be the holy grail of phylogenies for dinosaurs is being under dispute. Like a paper in 2017 did a major revision of dinosaur phylogeny and proposed that these ornithischia and theropod were um, as a new lineage. So what they actually say is this: Hey, I'm not gonna have the ornithischia as a group alone. I'm going to have the Ornistocelidae, right, which is a group that will contain now, I'm going to raise everything, that will contain the Ornistocelidae, that will contain the theropods and the Ornistocelidae into a single group. This is rock the world of phylogenies when it comes like to the dinosaur classification. Um, a lot of people actually did not like it, they're still on the dispute, right, it was done actually by a graduate student. But it's getting traction, and more and more people are starting to accept these uh, as a um, as a potential like new way to classify them. Beto, why nobody saw that before? Well, you, it's not that nobody sees it, you know. But you, uh, science is building small steps, not like eureka moments that are like revolutionize the whole thing. Uh, so people consider to be the convergence to be the way to do it, right? But then somebody says, well, let me get all dinosaurs. We have more fossils right now. We have more evidence. Let me do a, a revisit that hypothesis and actually uh, see what goes on. And once they do that, they figured out that, hey, like if I run the data now that I have more data, I get to a different conclusion, right? Like I said in the beginning of the class, like uh, phylogenies are hypothesis, right? If you want to listen to more detail about that, please watch this video right here. It's a very interesting, it's a nice summary, and then you can expect like a question or two on the exam about this dispute. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, if you want to get into the nuts and bolts of it, like, and then um, of this dinosaur classification like you can like watch that video going more detail but i'm going to work now with the traditional hypothesis that uh lizard hip dinosaurs and bird hip dinosaurs are distinguished groups it's somewhat new like to like to review this the classification of dinosaurs so let me work with, with the traditional view and then you're aware of the modern view now like i propose new view but i'm gonna work if like if they were still separated right um so here's like the lizard hip dinosaur and now you can actually see the socket there like in the tail there and then those are the 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 sarisha and then i like to say this that the ischium like the ischium forms a t with the pubis there because then like what i actually have like i could use the like the alphabetical order R S T, you know, to remind me the Sarisha, the pubis makes a T right there, you know. So, and the bird hipped ones um, that I have, like the arrangement that resembles that of uh, 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 
modern birds. Actually, here is like a, is a an arrangement of a, a black woodpecker, and you can see that the pubis actually projects so posteriorly so much that it actually touches the ischion in the back, right? So uh, both of these structures result in the same function, which is weight bearing and long strides. Okay, so for the exam, like what I'm going to expect you guys to do is like to have like a way to um, to distinguish between the shoe groups and then at least like know some of the major groups of dinosaurs right so so let's start with the ornithischia right in this group play here they all these guys are herbivorous and they are them five different groups but i'm going to cover like just three of them right the therophora the marginocephala and the ornithopoda there so and i do expect you guys to know these three terms here right so in these guys right um they all have like um uh a lot of broad, broad like uh leaf-shaped teeth right all these guys have broad leaf-shaped teeth and this broad leaf-shaped teeth is associated with their herbivorous diet okay so then the other like group of dinosaurs I'm gonna have are the lizard hip ones, and then they are made the two major groups that I'm gonna have are the sauropodomorpha and the theropods right here, right? Sauropodomorpha and the theropods, and um, the theropods are the group that are, like includes birds that people are revisiting right now, saying that these should have been there, but enough of that for now, right? So these guys. Um, they have, they can be herbivorous and they can be carnivorous ones, right? The sauropod and are mostly herbivorous, but theropods are carnivorous bird, are carnivorous animals, right? So, the teeth of Ornesthesia is uh, uh, evolved like teeth and jaws that could cope with plant material. They have a whole skull that is modified, like specifically for plant digestion. On top of that, like these guys have a lot of crest frills, horns, uh, and um, adornments to their skull, right? They don't have like a, a rounded head only. They have like bone arrangements around their head that make them like um, become like a little bit more interesting like when it comes like to their skull shape, right? Trying to draw like a, uh, a triceratops here, right? So I mean, should, if it's a triceratops, I mean like three horns, right? And then, so they're they're gonna have like a crest like that, right? So, and this group is known to have like complex social behaviors. The evidence for that is because once I find these fossils of this group, I don't find one. I find multiple ones indicating me that this guy this guy's probably living in herds, and they're divided into three major groups: the Therophora, Ornithopod, and the Marginocephala. All right let's review each one of those so we start with, like with the first ornesthesia right here which are the therophora here right uh, this is misspelled everywhere so these are the stegosaurs it's perhaps like one of the dinosaurs you actually guys know the name of like a stegosaur known because of the like spikes right here stegosaurs is not a monolith it's actually uh, a group of things right uh, they have like several different types of stegosaurs right and they're all quadrupeds, like sometimes like relatively large, like six meters long, at 18 feet, right? And have these blades on the back here, right? That people believe that it was for uh, radiation, right? Radiation of solar energy or like heat energy, right? Or even like for acquired, acquiring um, heat energy from the sun. Every time, every time you have a large surface area like this, animals tend to bask in the sun, exposing like these whole like large areas like to get more sun uh, heat, right? And the fact that they their lower la the the hind legs are much bigger than the lower the front legs, like the the arms, right, indicates that these guys are adapted for grazing vegetation, right? But I wouldn't be surprised if these guys could actually go into their upright stance and then like stand on their back of their legs, at least temporarily, to actually reach like higher vegetation, right? Uh, the spikes, of course, I use like for defense, right? 
and that's your typical stegosaur i do expect you guys like to if i show this picture on the exam you guys need to tell me this is a therophora okay and then the other group that i have here is the uh, therophora right the tank dinosaur right these guys are herbivores again and then they are called the tank dinosaur because of these osteodermal plates which are these bony parts that i have in their back that offer protection for them right these are really well armored dinosaur their ribs project like laterally more than most uh of the other hip uh, ribs that i've seen and then creating like almost like a shell in the back right so in this artistic rendition right here like you can probably see that these guys like uh are really heavily armored right and as a defense mechanism instead of having spikes on their tail like the stegosaurus had these guys actually had a club shaped um tail like uh, it's interesting because this is actually made of spongy bone this is actually not like solid bone so it wasn't probably too heavy and the fact that it's spongy bone allows it to absorb uh, impact things that are more porous can absorb a lot of like impact and so this was probably used like for defense and um male male combat right in the movie um in one of the jurassic parks they show one of these guys and they show this guy trying to strike like the ankle of a, a t-rex right it um it, it's possible because this is such like a, a huge like a mace you know like you know what a mace is like that, that weapon right they could probably break the ankle of a, a t-rex with ease right the next group is the ornithopods right so um please watch the video like it's a very interesting one right um but these guys have like many other ornithistia like crests over their heads you know or sometimes just elongated skulls like that you know and um the group actually contains it's a very diverse group of everything else i mentioned this is perhaps like the most diverse group so far right the um this group of the ornithopods contain like um uh one dinosaur known as the guanodont like highlighted right here right this is the first dinosaur like to be recognized as a dinosaur meaning that this is the first fossil that somebody dug and said what is this a giant lizard from the past how are you going to call it dinosaurs right so iguanodons were um uh thought like i thought no are actually the the holotypes of uh dinosaurs interesting enough like uh, they were named like iguanodons like i named after like uh, iguanas uh because of their appearance to that right the group is diverse it also contains the hadrosaurs the duck billed dinosaurs with massive numbers of molars right that allow these guys like to um to have like a herbivorous diet you you, you some stomachs of these guys are found of pine needles twigs and fruits like and this actually is very interesting because there's not that many animals out there that can actually make a living out of pine needles and twigs twigs are hard to chew on but if you have that kind of teeth like that is certainly like a lot easier right imagine that like imagine the nutritional value of a pine needle you know there's not much energy there unless you can have an excellent mechanical digestion on your mouth and then in that case you can actually <clears throat> excuse me you can actually have uh absorb like some of the nutritional value of that pine needle the hollow crest that these guys have like um these are uh parasol um parasol here right these guys if you look on the video that that um skull these guys like the the nose of these guys have like a chamber that goes right here and then comes back and this chamber uh horrible drawing but it's okay like this chamber that actually goes like all the way up there and back allows you to amplify the sound and it's hypothesized that these guys actually use uh infrasound low frequency sounds to communicate when they pipe air into that it produces a sound that like 
is on the low register, you know, much like a foghorn of a boat, you know. Now, finally, the group of the Marginocephalia, right? So it's another type of ornithistia. The name actually means margin to the head, and these guys have their big crest right there. Triceratops is one of the many, right? It's a genus of dinosaurs, but there are other types of these guys, right? They have like <clears throat> like a parrot beak like that, and still have molars on the back, right? Um, so these guys I find like uh, um, conglomerates of like 10, 20 individuals together on the fossil record, indicating that there's some like social behavior going on, and probably use these guys as uh, weapons, right? Now it's easy to think that those are weapons because they look uh, uh, threatening, you know, they look like something that could do some damage, right? Uh, that's pretty much it, it that I have to say about the Marcus of Alna. All right. So I'm going to stop now and make a second video for the Sarisha.